for these speakers. So if you ever have any ideas, don't hesitate to let me know. This is a little bit longer introduction than usual. It was sent to me by our speaker, uh, Kitty Bass, uh, and it, I decided to use the whole thing. It's a little bit longer uh, because it really does introduce her topic as well as the speaker. Mary Catherine Kitty Bass was introduced to Bowen theory and psychotherapy in the 1970s a few years into her clinical social work practice. In 1978, when she first heard Dr. Bowen at a family therapy conference, she felt her journey was converging back to nature, her interest since a teen, when he made the connection that family, human families are a part of nature. Dr. Bowen's thinking that human problems arose more from disharmony with nature than with human relationships and her learning then began a new lifelong path. Having a BA in secondary education and religion and a teacher certificate in social studies and biology and teaching biology for one year, Ms. Bass realized she was more interested in families of the teens as, than she was in teaching particular subjects. She explored how she might engage in that work by going to seminary. The last semester of her MDiv program, she was a successful recruit for a year's work, the requirement at the children's home as a social worker before entering an MSW program. After hearing Dr. Bowen, she believed the theory provided a lifelong pursuit, a challenge to live and study, and an opportunity to apply learning <clears throat> about how to live in harmony with nature. She completed the three-year postgraduate program at the Family Center, including supervision and advanced supervision training with Dr. Kerr, and participated in Dr. Dan Papro's research group for several years. Ms. Bass described herself as a Celtic agrarian New South woman. She was born in Magnolia, North Carolina, a small rural town in Duplin County the area to which her ancestors came from Scotland, Ireland, and England. She lived and worked in Raleigh in various clinical settings, including two hospitals, family services, and a private psychiatric practice for over 30 years. During this time, she also led an ongoing supervision group in Bowen Theory, presented family systems thinking to a number of seminary classes in pastoral care, lectured at the UNC Medical School, supervised resident psychiatrists interested in the theory, was a supervisor for clinical work as well as supervising for over 10 years at the UNC School of Social Work for second year MSW students. She was a diplomat and fellow with the American Board of Medical Psychotherapy. Several years before her parents died, Ms. Bass, as an only child, realized she would inherit the 300-acre family farm and ancestral home. So she began thinking about what she would do with this inheritance. Three years after her last parent died, she moved back to Magnolia. While her dream to establish a land use study center based on the application of Bowen theory did not materialize, she used what she had learned from the theory to work in an, in an agroecological setting towards sustainable practices, living in harmony with nature. She attributes her 17-year survival there in a corporate, money-driven culture, regressed societally and a major contributor to climate change, to her knowledge of Bowen theory as it relates to the relationship between humans and nature and societal process while under intensely anxious times. Her clinical work continued there in a rural health center, mental health center, and as an EAP provider for over 20 years for a home health care and hospice agency and for three years for the local hospital. Retired now to Wilmington, North Carolina, Ms. Bass continues a part-time private practice open in 1981. 
She is active as a master gardener and on the board for a program in horticulture therapy. She pretends sometimes to learn how to write creatively. She said to a Bowen Center colleague that she had spent a lifetime trying to differentiate herself and had finally given up to walk the beach, make hats, write poems, and drink scotch. The reply was, at a girl, you finally got it. Ms. Bass promises tonight not to do the Highland Fling or play the bagpipes, nor go a wee minute past the hour presentation of Bowen theory as it applies to reclaiming and creating relationships to place, land, and nature. Ms. Bass? I'm getting there. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, thanks for reading that too long introduction, Anne. Oh, my goodness. I had no idea how that would sound. But it's so good to see the names of so many of you that I've known over the years. And I just regret being unable to be in person there with all of you over the weekend. <clears throat> for all of us that are uh, involved in uh, work at the center, we know the objectives of the theory, but uh, as a way to begin, um, that would be a starting place to look at the concepts and then look at how they apply to agroecology and uh, go from there to look at a case example application in Magnolia and spend some time uh, thinking about our relationship to nature. I guess my objective, however, would be that given this time of uh, stress for all of us with the coronavirus uh, being uh, all of us in our homes, that we uh, use this time to just think more about relaxing and thinking outside the box. And um, I would be interested in your comments and your discussion as we uh, go into that later about how the theory really is a part of uh, our relationship with nature. <clears throat> An overview of the theory, of course, views families as emotionally driven systems. They are units of variable functioning capabilities based on evolutionary behavioral expressions. And this we know is driven by the anxiety of actual or perceived survival threat. Functionality of our families and of ourselves is determined by our ability to dis differentiate between thinking and feeling, and then to make thoughtful choices in our own best interest. We all are familiar with the concepts, the key one being differentiation of self, uh, how we uh, are programmed in our own family by the emotional process there, how we are a part of what's projected onto us from our parents, how that projection might have gone on for many generations, where we came into that uh, family, that our position as a sibling or an only child, and of course, how we immediately then get entangled in triangles. I've often said when all of these six concepts become overwhelming, we just emotionally cut off, we run somewhere else. And then of course, as this is unresolved, it becomes a part of a societal emotional process. As we all know, Dr. Bowen didn't develop, but talked about the ninth concept, which is the supernatural phenomenon. And uh, Dr. Kerr is proposing a 10th concept of unit disease. I would like for us to think about uh, stepping back and just observing and thinking with me about how this theory might apply to agroecology. Uh, Think outside the box for this. Agroecology embraces an understanding of ecological and social levels of coevolution, structure, and function. The goal of agroecology is to recover balance and to evoke self regulation. Well, this new field, I think, has been uh, growing since uh, the two, beginning of the 2000s 
Uh, we've been very fortunate here in New Hanover County to have our extension director uh, have a master's in agroecology. And this discipline not only looks at agriculture, but looks at agriculture in a context beyond what has been conventional agriculture that's been so destructive to the land, to the climate, to the environment, and to what we eat, both animals and plants. The focus in agroecology is on what is sustainable. And what is sustainable means what is economically viable, what is environmentally sound and socially just. Sustainability takes place within the harmonious interaction of humans, the agroecosystem, and the environment. <clears throat> How are human families a part of this? All right. How do we fit in? And how do we relate to all of this? How do the concepts of the theory inform our land use, both the land use around our home, the land use in a community, in a development, on a farm, in a forest, or land that is just idle? <clears throat> and what are the contributions of theory to agroecology? As we look at that concept by concept, you know, sort of think with me out of the box again about this. Um, will land that's developed till forested barren um, actually define itself if we keep abusing it? Because it is self-defining. Uh, you know, it has characteristics. A square inch of soil is a, a live organism with just unimaginable numbers of living fungi and virus and bacteria and all kinds of creatures. A tract of land has its own definition of how it has evolved to be what it is in relationship to the air currents around it, the wind flow, the sun exposure, the organic content in the soil, its tilth. The family emotional process refers to in a family, the, how the anxiety is expressed, um, suddenly and not so subtly. Um, as I thought about the farm in Magnolia, I realized that uh, land and the use of land is always involved in a cultural, communal, and human relationship emotional system of the landowner. What function does that tract of land serve for the owner's survival? And how does that survival determine how uh, he will use or she will use the land, how it will determine how the priority of the land use will be determined, what the goal, the purpose, and what happens in that decision. A family projection process looks at how in a family system, this anxiety is projected often onto one person, one individual, or maybe several, or to a force rather outside the family. In looking at land, the issues of the landowner can be projected as well into the process of how this land is used, how it is developed or not. And it is often driven by economics, greed, power, rather than the needs and characteristics of the land. Uh, as we think about what drives this, it often is anxiety and living here in Wilmington, I just, can help but react every time I hear about beach renourishment. Just so much money spent in moving the sand of a beach, which will be removed when the next storm comes. Uh, this is so not listening to the land, uh, and neither are constructing beaches in the desert, in my opinion. Concept four has to do with how this process is passed on over generations and how over generations emotionality is projected. And I believe it's been my experience that the same thing happens with land. People continue to plant or do the same thing that's always been done without really paying attention to what the land is saying it needs. Is it depleted? Uh, has it been abused? Has it been uh, over fertilized? Has the land been destroyed with chemicals? Uh, there is a mentality that it's always been done this way. And so there isn't an opportunity to really listen to the land and to be present to the land. 
Concept five has to do, of course, with sibling possession. And this may seem a real far-fetch to think of land that way, but if you look at how land plots are developed, uh, they follow a sequence and they are connected and they're in relationship to each other and in relationship to the people and the culture and the area in which they exist. Of course, land becomes a part of a triangle. I always knew in Magnolia when I was on the town board and they started fussing about land that I had intentionally left as a little town city forest, that it was a way to divert attention from something that was really significant that was going on, because of course that wasn't very significant at all. But it becomes a part of a political tool and a part of an economic process that removes itself from really the land. When all of this seems a bit overwhelming or people are just simply ignorant of the land, there is a cutoff, an emotional cutoff. I am very, I have been very surprised here in Wilmington with learning how people are so disconnected from food, from the grocery store, from what grows, from what happens, from the people that grow the food, the people that harvest it, what goes into that whole process. So in a cutoff, it's just running and ignoring the reality of what is involved in agriculture. It's never seeming to be present. And if there is sight, people really don't see what they see. In concept eight, a societal emotional process, a regression of knee-jerk reactivity is just based on that, not on principled thinking. And it raises some questions about, you know, how the facts right now uh, of the coronavirus are presented to us. Uh, and is this actually where we are now in the process of uh, just emotional reactivity? <clears throat> Dr. Bowen worked on a ninth concept. Uh, excuse me, I'm going to take a sip of water. It was a supernatural phenomenon. <clears throat> and there are many ways to think about spirituality, which was initially in the concept title, but it, it was changed to supernatural phenomenon. Spirituality, of course, refers to what's purposeful and meaningful in our lives and perhaps an effort to move it from that to uh, the supernatural will be an interesting uh, process to see developed. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Dr. Carr has worked on concept 10, a unit disease. <coughs> this looks at underlying conditions that are a part of the ways humans respond to anxiety. Uh, I've often heard Dr. Bowen say, that we will do one of three things. We will get sick, go crazy, or act out uh, when there's too much anxiety uh, that we are dealing with. I think this also uh, is related to how when land is not really understood for what the land is, but is abused and used by humans who think they are in control of the land, there are multiple ways to look at how there's collapse disease and how that is a part of climate change, how there is a collapse of the land, the health of the land. And is this process in nature similar to the human family? Is it really like the human family? When I went back to Magnolia, um, I was really fortunate to have the opportunity to be a part of coordinating a project there. The Kellogg Foundation um, had funded 18 different states in the United States all over the country to be involved in rural community projects in agriculture uh, in an effort to focus on sustainability on these small to mid-sized family farms and their communities in an effort to see how these farms might be saved, uh, given that at this time, 20 years ago, when this project happened, uh, it was certainly the beginning or really getting into 
a time when the big ag and big agriculture and corporations were managing huge, huge tracts of land uh, rather than actually farming an individual farm uh, to make economical um, profit for the farms, they became larger and larger. So this was an effort back in 96 to 2000 to really look at what could happen in a small rural community. This grant money was administered by North Carolina State University and a and University and then seven non-governmental organizations. <clears throat> this was the first time they had worked together on such a project and they were the administrative uh, board and then in each community there was an advisory council and a coordinator that worked with the project. Um, the scientists and professors at State and A&T uh, provided the research and background for the projects that were selected in these communities uh, for the work that would occur during that three-year period of time, which was later extended to about three and a half to four years of time. It was important that the principles of everything that we did was around sustainability. That provided a base that really was very useful and it was very helpful to come back to principles for what we were doing uh, and they were the principles of sustainability balance economic viability environmental soundness and social justice what has happened in traditional agriculture has focused on the economic viability and often at the expense of the environment and most certainly at the expense of people and human labor the issue in Magnolia, <clears throat> excuse me, in this little small rural town was that Magnolia, a small town of maybe there are 2,000 people there now, then there were around 1,200. Um, it was the home of Wendell Murphy. And Wendell Murphy was an ag teacher uh, and he was the founder of Murphy Family Farms. <clears throat> you must realize that what Wendell did and developed was absolutely by the book from North Carolina State University, from evidence-based science, and the very best practices in swine management. So this development was not only academic, it was scientific, it was a part of culture, and in this little town uh, was the first hog farms and also several years prior to then had been the first poultry homes. And this is a confined animal farming operations which would take the rest of the night for me to describe. It's very hard to say what it's like to drive down a five mile stretch of road, which was what Wendell purchased and build huge hog houses, each one holding um, over a thousand hogs. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Murphy was a billionaire from this uh, enterprise. He made a tremendous amount of money. He had contract farmers that were able to go to banks and borrow money, sometimes up to a million dollars to build these houses. Um, he was listed on the uh, cover of Forbes magazine. During this time, he also was a state senator and he passed 19 bills that excused environmental regulations for family farms. And this Murphy family farms uh, came under that description. He also was a developer of a gated community that was, is quite elegant at scale and very nice. It's River Landing, it's a golf course, clubhouse, state-of-the-art fitness center. It happens, however, that River Landing was built on a river bank. And it was built during the time Mr. Murphy was a senator. And in order for the land to sustain the houses, actually he dropped from the air telephone poles to build up the land over which he then had dirt hauled and on top of that built these homes. Perhaps I don't need to tell you, but in the last hurricane, 85% of these homes ranging from 
a half a million to several million dollars were destroyed. A little bit about the demographics of Dupin County. It was founded in 1750 and was the largest Scotch-Irish settlement in the New World. Between the years that I worked on this project, there were 42 to 49,000 people. As you can see, it's quite small. Now there are 10,000 more, 20 years later. It's the number one county currently in this country in pork production. It produces each year 1,957,000 364 hogs. In North Carolina is the seventh largest state in hog production. When Mr. Murray decided, uh, Murphy decided to sell the farm, he sold to Smithfield in Virginia, and then Smithfield sold it to an operation in China. So now all the hog houses in Dupin County are owned by a Chinese pork industry. There are some interesting factors that go into hog production. They produce five times the amount of human waste daily. We're in Dupin County, it's two times daily the amount of waste of the population of New York City each day. When you combine the hog industry with the poultry industry, in, 1950, in 2015, 1915, in 2015, Dupin County had the highest number of boilers in North Carolina. It produced 69 million chickens. The poultry production has tripled since 1997. It was in this context that the Partners in Agriculture started their journey of using grant money to be sustainable. And there was an outline from the Administrative Council that made this uh, easy to follow. We had a listening project. We uh, met in town meetings and invited the community to come. We had presentations uh, from the people at State and from the local Cooperative Extension Office. Uh, we explained that the whole focus of the project was explained. It was explained to the citizens that uh, the whole idea was that it be a, a grassroots ground up project and our goal was to listen to the community and from what the community identified as issues for them, then to formulate goals, and then to, to out of that, uh, use the money to implement these projects. And at the conclusion, we would report back to the town, to the county, and to the state about what uh, had happened with, their, with the money that had come in. There were a number of projects that we uh, developed by the advisory board. Uh, there were issues that, uh, they identified, and I will read some of those to you from some of the uh, publication. Um, what was important to Kellogg was that the Kellogg Foundation was looking at more sustainable ways of growing our food and maintaining rural communities. It meant caring about the needs of farmers as well as the consumers, being concerned about efficient and profitable production, and the environment and making sure that our agricultural systems had a positive impact on social lives, the community and the young people. Uh, the survey, uh, a survey was developed by Magnolia residents and the interview, uh, the interviews were completed with the information by the information gathered in the surveys. And we learned from that what was important to the people in Magnolia, uh, what they might be able to uh, see happen in that in this project uh, that could make a difference and that would be important to them. Uh, they were in-depth surveys and it was the questionnaires were all the same so each person on the advisory committee went door to door talking to people and found out what they were concerned about. Uh, the people surveyed said that some of the challenges of farming were the lack of security or guaranteed profit. It was hard work. There was strong competition from very large operations. There was high, high cost of equipment, seed and fertilizer. There was the need to keep up with technology and to have an adequate cash flow. Most said that important advantages were that they could be their own boss and felt pride in their work and that the farm was a good place for children to grow up. The majority of the people surveyed said that they would rather, uh, they would prefer to farm for themselves and that they can make more money during the good years. 
but then there were lower risk to marketing associated with the contract farming. They were also guaranteed to receive expertise in their farming operation, uh, and they could have easy access to bank loans if they were a part of a contract farming. They, um, there was more accessibility to markets, a, strong, a stronger marketing strategy, and they were all listed as important factors for successful farming in the future. Diversifying farm products and developing maybe niche markets were seen as possibilities that would be innovative for small to mid-sized farms. Continuing to do contract farming was also identified as, as helping to keep farmers in business. And at the same time, what we also was hear, were hearing was all the problems associated with the huge lagoons that had to be washed out each day, the depletion of the aquifers that furnished the water for this many hogs. We were hearing about the odors. We were hearing about sickness. We were hearing about the flies. We knew that in the midst of this, the rivers had become contaminated. The oceans had become contaminated and fish were dying. It was during this time that a new organism was discovered, Fisteria. Part of its life cycle was as an animal and part of it was as a plant. Nothing like that had been discovered before. All the people that we talked about were concerned about the environment and they thought that was a crucial, most important issue. They were concerned about the animal waste. They were interested in working to find creative ways to problem solve, to take care of the land, the water, the air. Um, <clears throat> most people felt that being a successful farmer would set the best example for young people. So from this information, we set about to develop uh, projects. We designed a, or someone from state designed for us from the uh, school of design a heritage garden magnolia had been at one time the world's largest bulb market uh, larger than the bulb markets in holland we had a rich history of the land there interesting fossils natural wells one of the problems however that with the contract farming and with big ag was that uh, the hay that was grown from these hog lagoon runoffs when they sprayed the field lagoons was creating chemical issues for the animals to which it was fed. They were still growing tobacco during that time and there was an enormous amount of chemicals used to control uh, tobacco worms. And so that summer or for several summers we use some of the funding to hire a college student as a tobacco worm scout. They actually went in the fields and saw areas where there were more tobacco worms than others and uh, one farmer said it saved him a tremendous amount of money. We organized an organic vegetable school over at the community college. Um, and then one of the most important things we did, I believe in the project, was we sponsored a number of water forums. Um, we also arranged with Murphy Farms to have a sustainable farming tour for the hog growers. And then at the end of uh, the project, we had an environmental summit for the county. This work was done by the community, but we also worked in partnership with Murphy Family Farms, uh, with the county community college, with of course the universities I'd mentioned. We also invited participation with uh, the state local representative in our House of Representatives. She uh, learned a great deal about sustainability, about agriculture, and uh, at one point even had a delegation from Kansas come to Dupin County to see the operations there. And it was interesting, she asked me to do a little presentation on some of the work with sustainability. And I mentioned Bowen Theory, and one of the legislators said her coach had trained at Georgetown. So that was rather interesting. We also worked very closely with the Department of Water Quality, with the Riverkeeper. Uh, our meetings were all open each month to the public, uh, and all the work was developed by the advisory committee. We had some interesting outcomes. We installed the community garden. Um, we saved farmers money with the projects. Uh, we 
attending and participating in a national sustainable swine production conference uh, in a nearby county. Um, it was interesting because the animals in Duplin County in those huge factory farm houses are fed enormous amounts of antibiotics and hormones. And there was uh, an animal production in the Midwest that did none of that. The animals were on the land and they were rotated on the land and the, the people who tended them had such a good relationship with the animals, the mother hogs would even let them uh, touch the baby pigs. That's unheard of, unless you are really, really trusted by the mother pig. We worked on a relationship with Murphy Family Farms, which initially said we could never work together because we were absolute opposites. Um, we <clears throat> worked with them, however, to come up with a collaborative design for the town wastewater treatment plant. Uh, in one of the forum, um, we learned from the visit with DWQ that the town was uh, discharging gray water uh, into the creek. Further on down from the town's discharge was a huge discharge from the hog farm. And this discharge, of course, went into the river, which went into the ocean, uh, which also, of course, affected the atmosphere, as it did from all these lagoons and from all these processes, uh, creating a tremendous carbon footprint. Uh, I have a cousin that teaches at Virginia Tech. He has his doctorate from um, Cornell, and he works in forestry and in the relationship between carbon and the destruction of trees and uh, on the map in the United States, of course, Duplin County produces the most. We also worked in Murphy Farms to provide the hog farmers with credit for seeing a different way to grow animals and to grow plants. There is a huge research station in the next county over from us that's funded by North Carolina State University and it's a part of the university and it focuses on sustainable integrated farming operations. Low, we did all we could to develop a plan for our town. Uh, Murphy Farms and the board uh, designed a plan for the runoff orders from both the town and the industry to be managed through an artificial wetland. And from that artificial wetland, develop then um, a park area for everyone. And we thought we had included everyone in the planning and design, but when it came to the town board for a vote, they had already decided that there was no way that was going to happen. So we went on to uh, work on and think about how we would put together an environmental summit. The environmental summit was the next day after the hog growers had participated in the sustainability tour that had lasted all day. The environmental summit involved all the county governmental officers. It also involved the executives from all these uh, plants. There's um, their major corporate headquarters for the poultry and major corporate headquarters for the swine. There are about five families that run and operate these large um, corporations. The, the poultry and the pork industry join together to build a rendering plant. I cannot tell you the intensity of and the number of dead animals that every day are collected by what is referred to as dead trucks uh, from dead boxes outside all these huge um, houses for growing animals. The picture was rather grim and it's rather difficult to talk about so we didn't know how to address it in the environmental summit and we decided that what we would do would be begin our presentation with the presentation from the Riverkeeper. And he talked about the place of Duplin County, the place where it was located, the content of the soil, uh, it's sandy loam. The first uh, hog lagoon was lined with clay that came from 
an Indian Native American burial ground outside Magnolia. When there was a huge flood, it of course overflowed and there were lots of issues that were a part of that that town didn't know about. Um, so the Riverkeeper focused on the river and I'm sure there weren't tears, but I like to think there were. I was sitting at a table with some of the executives from one of the processing plants and he looked at one of his buddies and said, oh my God, look what we have done to our river. Uh, because the waste often is discharged into the river, which of course is very destructive. <clears throat> that um, brings us to looking at the conclusion of a demonstration of how to think about what gets triangled politically, um, the position this little town has in the county, the number one position uh, certainly that Mr. Uh, Murphy had as the person who really was very spot on with this development of this industry. But Bowen theory also takes us, I think, to a different place as well. Uh, not only are there concepts that are useful in looking at how these energy systems uh, manage their high levels of anxiety or not, um, I always remember the belief papers we had to do in the postgraduate program. So, you know, what is your belief about nature? And what is your relationship to nature? Um, one of the uh, scientists, researchers who teaches at State said, there is enough technology, enough information, enough science, enough research for the world to be fed organically and for there to be sustainable food systems around the world. The problem is not technology, the problem is not science, the problem is a people problem. When the river keeper was there and we were looking at all the things that happened to the landscape and to the lagoons and to the waterways, he said this issue is a spiritual issue. It has to do with values and what people believe. So where do we learn what we learn about nature? My mother was terrified of forest, of trees. You were not to go close to trees, you were not to play in trees, you would have nothing to do with trees. My dad, on the other hand, you know, there were half of the 300 acre farm was in trees and half of it was in cultivation and he spent a great deal of time knowing what was in those forests and what grew there. It wasn't until during my time at Georgetown that I learned that when my mother once was going to visit her sister in the hospital and passed a large area here in town on a sidewalk, but it was a wooded area, she was um, attacked by someone that she was able to fight off. But the trees and forest to her brought back all those memories. She didn't ever tell me as a child why I was to stay out of the forest, but just simply projected onto me all of her anxiety and fear. What's taught us by our parents and our grandparents and how do our siblings react? And what does society and culture and religion teach us about nature? That we are subdue it to control it? What? Start thinking about a relationship past place to our personal relationship to nature. Uh, I have recently become very intrigued with uh, a, a phenomenon I knew nothing about. It was it is forest therapy and forest medicine, and learned that we really co-evolved with trees in a savanna when humans first uh, became present on the earth. And currently to this day, if we are in a savanna or with trees, uh, we not only feel better, but there is documented research to indicate what happens in the chemical exchange of the turpins and trees and the human body, um, how it's calming and quieting. And that in some countries, Japan, in Germany, and some of the Scandinavian countries, forest medicine is a specialty after you have gotten your MD. Um, 
because there is research that indicates how much being in trees, being present in trees, not in competition with how many steps or how fast you can walk a mile, but just to be present in trees, um, to open your senses, your hearing, your sight, your smell, your touch, your taste to that atmosphere reduces blood pressure, lowers stress, it boosts the immune system, decreases the anti-cancer protein production. Um, I had I did some interesting reading uh, from uh, Arvey. He is an Austrian biologist. One of his books, The Healing Code of Nature, was very fascinating. Um, and I share this quote with you. Um, he says, taking into account the evolution of our species in the future is a future oriented approach to medicine. It's known as evolutionary medicine. Evolutionary medicine gives us a chance to understand the emergence of diseases in a much larger context and thus to understand it better. More than half of the infectious viruses and bacteria to which we are exposed developed after our ancestors had transitioned to farming and started breeding animals. Humankind needs to be seen for what it is, namely a natural species that emerged from the network of life and that can never, under any circumstances, remove itself from this context. A medicine that ignores the nature-human relationship will never be a successful medicine. In thinking about actually um, what goes into all of um, looking at how we claim and reclaim who we are in relationship to land, the land that's around us, the place, the community we live in. I, ha I have friends who've never lived outside a city. They have no idea what it is like to even think about being connected to a place or being connected to land. Some of them tell me they have no idea what that would be. They have no idea what I'm even talking about. Um, all of it is a part of our healing and I believe the concepts of theory have a lot to offer in terms of our expanding our awareness of not only family systems, but all living systems. It's amazing how trees communicate, um, how we are, we share a living ancestor that's the fungi, um, and how all that is related to what currently is happening now with the coronavirus. The director of extension here mentioned an article in the New York Times that I wasn't able to uh, locate, but he said that the article had to do with the coronavirus as it related to the loss of biomass in the world and in, in land um, in living things. Um, there are interesting questions and so much that we don't know, but it truly is intriguing. So I have appreciated a chance to share some of this experience. Um, it was indeed a privilege and an honor to go back to that little town and be a part of, of wanting to uh, see the, the town move forward in a different way to uh, embrace its past and embrace nature. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I think um, the town perhaps unanimously saw things differently. There were a few of us that uh, saw things maybe as a progressive way the town might move forward. Um, unfortunately, the town has continued to uh, become more and more of a ghost town. So in closing, before we uh, have our discussion, uh, Wendell Berry deserves to have the last word. He was, after all, the father and the grandfather of agroecology. And I love his poem, and I think it's so appropriate as we think about just wondering about these wanderings in nature. Um, he writes about the peace of wild things. 
and it seems so appropriate for what we're going through now. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake up in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. So as they say on television, thank you for the privilege of your time. And now we will have discussion. I would be interested in your thoughts and your reactions and your questions. Hey everyone. Um, so for the discussion portion, um, if you could use the um, raise hand function of Zoom, uh, to go ahead and um, be put in the discussion queue. Um, Kitty Bass will uh, call on you. Um, when you um, so you can find it by clicking on um, the participants button on the bottom uh, part of your Zoom window. And um, a window should pop up on the right hand side of your screen. And um, you'll see uh, inside the window a list of uh, everyone in the room. Um, when you, um, there should be a button uh, called raise hand there. And when you, um, when you click on it, a little blue um, uh, hand icon will uh, pop up next to your name. So she'll know exactly who to call on. Did, um, Ann, did you raise your hand, Ann Nicholson? I may not be doing this correctly, uh, Jessica. Um, sorry, Ann Nicholson, you're um, you're on. You are <laughs> muted right now. And I think somebody else is in front of um, of you. Okay, I'm sorry. You know what? I'm gonna um, I'm gonna okay. All right, um, Jean Blackburn. Okay. Am, am I messing this up? No, this no, no. Up? Let me, um, sorry. You'll do it. You'll do it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let me, um, give me one second. Okay. Okay. Jean Blackburn, could you, um, let's have you be, um, the first one up. And I thought I saw your, um, hand go up. But now I'm unmuted. All right. Hello, Kitty Bass. Hi, Jean Blackburn. It's so hello, good. Hello, hello, fellow North Carolinian. Yes, it is so good to see you. <laughs> what a great presentation. <clears throat> and uh, I knew about your interest before you and I sort of uh, miss each other for a while. And <clears throat> it sounds like <laughs> you have learned a tremendous amount about sustainable farming. And I think I grew up on a farm that was sustainable farming. But then that also moved to the corporate farms. And I think we lost a tremendous 
relationship with the earth when that happened. Yes. And I'd just like to hear your thoughts about that. I could not agree more, Aunt Jean. Um, we have lost relationship, we have lost culture, we have lost customs, and so many of the diversified skills that a farmer had who was really farming, not just um, using the land. Uh, has been lost with this large big ag and corporate agriculture and it becomes driven by money and time and um, there is no relationship to the earth. There is no, or there doesn't seem to be from my observation. I could not agree with you more. My father loved the earth and he taught the whole family how to love the earth. And I think the benefit of having your hands in the dirt is beyond anything else one could do. Yes. Thanks for the presentation. Thanks, Jean. It's so good to see you again. Ann Nicholson um, is up next. Um, well, uh, this was just great. Um, and I am so impressed with your uh, commitment to understanding the relationship or utilizing theory to understand man's relationship with the earth. And I wondered if you would make any connection with the disconnect with the earth with Bowen's ideas about societal regression. I, I very much see that, Anne. Um, a disconnect with the earth is a mechanized way of um, a relationship. It really, um, life and living organisms and relationships become commodities. And um, there isn't there isn't the presence for the uniqueness of what is a defined or differentiated piece of land or animal or person. It's just all in the service of money and power and greed and more money and more power and more greed and let's hurry up and get some more money and power and greed. And <clears throat> it all becomes in more of an emotionally reactive experience as I observe it than something that's thoughtful. And because this experience of working with this group of people in this little town who behind closed doors were fearful of everything about the hog farms and about the hog industry because it was it's huge. Um, it was really helpful that the project outlined clearly that it had to be focused on principles because it would have been very, very easy to get more caught up in all the emotional reactivity of corporate hog farms that uh, would see us as the enemy. Um, there were, there is an environment that can be pretty brutal and pretty mean. Wow. And um, to keep it focused on principles was very much a lifesaver. Um, at the end of, of those four years of working together, the researcher at Murphy Family Farms, who was a PhD biologist, um, said, you know, this four years has been a relationship of extraordinary respect because we see things so differently, but we have been able to accomplish things that were really useful for both sides. And I think 
understanding something about Bowen theory and making some effort, although at times, let's be real clear, I got very called to emotional reactivity, um, you know, was just real useful to me in, in being able to uh, find ways to survive it. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I could not agree more, Anne, with, and you've done so much work yourself on that, and just so much appreciation to you and to the people at the center and to Victoria and Ann McKnight and Ann Hearn for all that you've done to put this together. I really am enormously grateful to you. Well, thank you. This was very valuable. Appreciate it. Nicholas Follett, you're up next. Something that uh, I am learning something about, I've learned something about over the last few years, and that is a whole food plant-based diet. And um, that way of eating and living and lifestyle uh, focuses on eating natural foods, not processed foods. And yet at the same time, you and I probably both know the world is not going to become vegan tomorrow. <laughs> and, and yet in the 90s, when we began this project in Magnolia, research out of the University of Chicago at that time was saying the one thing everyone could do to uh, really alleviate global warming and climate change at that point would be to not eat meat and meat products. And you're absolutely right. It seems like um, these fake meats and fake cheeses uh, are so highly processed. I, w I wonder sometimes, you know, if the actual meat is not maybe better for us than uh, these highly processed chemical uh, products. Uh, but that is such a very interesting point. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Also for being less than seven years old. <laughs> Okay, Ann McKnight. Um, give me one second. Let me unmute you. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Accidentally lowered your hand. I apologize. Thank you so much for your presentation. That was fascinating. I, um, you know, I have um, a whole set of family in um, in North Carolina, right around Raleigh. And uh, well, I had one question. First of all, maybe you said this, but what what was it that stopped the project or stopped the project from going forward? That was one question I had. I mean, what well, the, well, the, the project was designed to last only four years. Uh, the funding was for a four year period of time. So the project was, um, you know, time limited. We had this much money and this much time to accomplish the goals the community set. One of the projects we worked on during the, uh, one of the individual projects that we worked on in the larger uh, Magnolia Partners project itself was this um, design with Murphy Family Farms to do uh, an artificial wetlands. And, uh, you know, what ended that specific uh, project that was a part of the bigger project was the politics of the town. Mm -hmm. and how anxious people became over a process that would be different from a wastewater treatment facility with chemicals and a grant and money and more people to be hired and more chemicals. So it was, you know, very interesting because um, what we were proposing, both the uh, hog industry and the people that were working in the sustainability project was a way to reduce the cost and the chemicals. Uh, but that was, um, that was something the town just could not wrap its brain around. So it was voted down. But the project itself, uh, all of these projects all over the United States were for four years. So it was time limited from the beginning. We had that period of time to use the money to address the issues the community raised. But thank you for raising that question, Anne. And thank you for what you have done at the center and for putting on this conference, you and Victoria. And well, I, I take a minor role. But my second question is, 
you know, it seems like there's a whole upwelling in North Carolina of, um, of uh, produce produced for farmers markets. Uh, yes. And I, I just wondered where that fit into this whole picture now. That is, that is a wonderful, wonderful comment, Anne. And, and thanks so much for, for raising that. Yes, I think that there is, as a friend of mine said, the Underground Railroad still runs. And with the onslaught of so much big corporate ag and big ag, there has also been a growth in uh, organic farms, in uh, community farm uh, boxes that are delivered in farmers markets. There has been uh, a project developed with state and a and T to uh, have donation stations at farmers markets where people can donate either buy food that's there from the local farmers or contribute money. And at the end of the farmers market, that money is taken and then goes back to the farmers that are there to buy produce. And then that fresh produce goes to the food pantries so that people who are truly unable to uh, buy fresh food have a chance to have fresh produce. Because often with the food pantries and um, income restricted families, fresh food is something they really don't get. It's either canned or packaged. And so this has been a, a part of something Wilmington has participated in this past year that's been, excuse me, has been very interesting and well received and we feel like we have really uh, been a part of providing fresh produce to people who otherwise would not be able to, to have that. But there has been in North Carolina a real growth of that. And one of the things that was an outcome of, of this partners project in the state of North Carolina was the realization of a need for refrigerated uh, transportation, a need to develop these niches for farmers markets and I think that was a positive overall for the whole state because there were three other communities that joined us in North Carolina in participating in this. We were chosen because of our relationship with the, with the animal uh, industry. But there was one community that was African-American farmers that were peanut growers. And there was another community that was in the mountains and their focus was on produce farming. So, um, I think that was a very positive thing that came out of the whole project in North Carolina was support for these farmers and it's been wonderful to see. Oh, thank you. Um, next up is Victoria Harrison. Thank you. Kitty Bass, it was so good to see you, even so virtually. You. It's good to see you and thanks thank for putting you. together the conference tomorrow. And you're part of this tonight. It's just fantastic. It's really exciting that we can do it online. Yes, isn't it? If not in person. Right. Um, one of the purposes of the conference is to further ongoing productive projects based on the thinking that people bring and the thinking stirred. <clears throat> and you had a, a great list of, of questions about three quarters of the way through your talk today that one of them was, what is your belief about nature? What's your relationship with nature? But there were three or four others. And, oh, um, sorry. And I just um, wondered if I could, if you could repeat those because I thought they would be great homework. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I can't get, I, I'm so computer illiterate, I can't okay. get back to those questions, but I will look at uh, that after we get off the program and I will email those to you. I think that would be great. Um, the, um, one of the ideas that I'm working on here in Houston is, how to use this triple lot that I have in downtown Houston for educational programming, gardening, but also educational programming. We did a, 
we did one project on building soil mm -hmm. and the vitality of soil and and um the woman who taught the course took examples from my yard where the soil was dead yes. and i didn't know it i didn't know what dead soil looked like and then she compared it with living soil and we yes. you know we built beds that brought in compost and mulch and it's been such a such a rich personal project um but i'm i was thinking about ways to um build on that and your list of questions i think are really important is really important for people to think with that could lead people to action productive steps so thank you for that yes what are you doing next or what are you currently working on well what i'm currently working on is hoping one day to do more with my little yard here around this little patio home where i live and i am on the board of an ability garden at our arboretum and the ability garden provides a chance for people with different levels of ability to be involved in gardening and planting and growing nice. seeds and um it has been a real honor to be on that board and i work in with the master gardeners here as well and do work with the uh, donation station for food uh, for the vets uh, here and i want to do some more writing and work and um i miss i miss the farm i miss living in that area um, and it was really hard to to leave that home in that place um, but we have to move on to chapter two sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And good luck with your garden and good yeah. luck with your project. Uh, you. I wonder if you have considered a community garden there on that spot and uh, an evolving a particular yeah. population of young people who might be motivated to learn and go on into agriculture and farming. And there's just phenomenal things written about community gardens. We have here in Wilmington a man who is a retired engineer, and he has taken upon himself to form a group called Wilmington Green. And he has built and gotten money from banks and corporations and da 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 to build these community gardens in areas where there are food deserts and to involve young people who uh, were delinquent or pre delinquents or were in difficulty with the law. And there's been just so much interesting uh, information written about these programs and how they bring people together and uh, people can learn so much from that. It's really interesting and I'll, I will, I'll make this quick. It's interesting that I'm in an area that has been so gentrified with mm -hmm. zero lot houses that mm -hmm. these young families have no yard, no gardens, and we have two chickens a pond, so many birds. So I do think that there are many opportunities yes. for our yard to be a community garden in an in an unusual kind of way. Absolutely. So Absolutely. yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I <laughs> I will, mean, I, I'll be interested to hear, Victoria. Okay, good. Yes. <laughs> okay, next up is um, Tim Pearson. Uh, hello and thank you very very much um i'm uh calling in from anchorage alaska i grew up amongst the alaska native peoples a uh, village of about 200 uh the uh, they have a very spiritual connection to the land and i'd be interested to know what you learned in terms of concept nine in terms of uh spirituality and the supernatural um uh, I come from a Christian faith tradition, and in that, uh, the Holy Spirit imbues and then fills everything, and prayer is extremely powerful. So I'd just be interested in your observations and thoughts. Well, I thank you for that question, because that is something, you know, very dear to my heart and very close. I, I come from a Celtic tradition where uh, all of nature and all of the land and all living things are as you said so well, infused with the holy. 
and it's all sacred. And that does inform, I believe, how you handle a relationship, how you manage yourself, and how you relate to other people and to the land. It is a part of our belief system. Um, I belonged for a time to a congregation, uh, the Unitarian Universalist con Congregation, which had uh, an earth ministry program as part of what it offered. And uh, I was ordained as a community minister in that tradition for the ministry of earth interrelationships. And um, that journey was really a very meaningful and powerful one for me. And those sites may be interesting to go to to learn uh, how they um, develop green churches and um, how they do work with the environment. Uh, and there are those traditions in most all of the Christian denominations that are really very powerful ones. Um, it is part of my own belief system that whatever the energy is that moves in the direction of evolution is for me how I would come close to not being able to define but think of God. Um, so, you know, that is a personal belief of mine and it makes this work um, you know really interesting and you may be familiar with Matthew Fox the theologian who has written so much about uh, creation spirituality and he talks so much about native people and traditions and what they teach us and he has a phenomenal uh, daily meditation that may be of interest uh, because he really focuses on just such beautiful things about nature and the earth and creation. Um, it, it makes this the work of tending the land uh, a very sacred spiritual practice that's uh, purposeful and meaningful. Um, I was very influenced by a number of different things one came from an attorney whose uh, background was as an environmental attorney. He was on our board when I worked at Family Services. And I remember him telling me in the 80s, he said, um, you know, you have worked, you've been to graduate school, you've been on graduate school faculty, you've been a supervisor, you've basically been to the top, so to speak, in your profession. When are you going back to the farm? and do something that really matters for the earth. <laughs> and I thought never. And then of course I did. <laughs> but uh, he uh, certainly influenced me over the years. That little voice kept going on in my head. When are you going back to the land and do something that matters? <laughs> so good luck with your project. And it's fascinating that you're in Anchorage and uh, I know it must be ri very rich living there. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Up next is um, Amy Gullickson. Sorry, we were we had dueling unmuting. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thanks so much for a really delightful uh, presentation. I'm uh, in Melbourne, Australia, but I grew up in South Dakota you know, next to a farm. So this yeah. is all, you know, all that, all the things you described are home feelings to me. I'm, I'm wondering about the, you talked about the principles and how important um, the principles were for shaping the research and all the activities that you did together. Yeah. And could you say more about how you got to them? Like, where did they come from? Or how did you? The principles were, or the definition of what is sustainable. Um, okay. The definition of sustainability is that triangled balance of uh, it must be economically viable um, but as important it must be environmentally sound and it must you know respect the principles of nature and soundness and be congruent with science and that is something that big ag has not really addressed and then <laughs> equally important also is social justice environmental justice, because often the work in Dupin County, for example, uh, has set up a system, in my opinion, that's just modern day slavery. Um, 
there would not be those operations that could function, the processing plants, the care for the animals, the uh, boarding them on three-story trucks, screaming, yelling, uh, the suffrage the animals go through, the prodding them with electric um, prods to get them under these trucks. This work is awful work. Washing out those hog houses where the animals have stood so long in their own feces that often their little feet grow into the grill. Uh, they can't move. They can't lie down. They can't. Uh, and this is hard work. Um, it's the underbelly of a lot of money that people don't see. Um, but for it to be, this is not sustainable. There is nothing about big no. ag, these corporate uh, CAFOs that's sustainable. Uh, so to have a focus that came from Kellogg and from the university that was the grantor of the money that said these practices must be sustainable, uh, that for me was the buy-in on uh, presenting an invitation to apply for the grant to our town board which they mm -hmm. did, they wanted, they wanted to do, but that's an excellent question. But for, for so the, the, the principles were mandated, essentially. The principles were mandated. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, that's really helpful. Yes, mm -hmm. and it, it was very helpful in, uh, in dealing with that extreme emotionality, because uh, at the end of our environmental summit for the county, the comment was it was the first time ever in the county that any issue about any issues for a program that lasted for several hours uh, had happened because always they ended in rotten tomatoes and eggs. Uh, you know, there was so much emotional reactivity and um, they were always so uh, angry and, you know, really at war and there was nothing productive that had come, but that had been useful. So. I attribute that to us having to stick to principles. <laughs> Otherwise, mm -hmm. we would throw an eggs too. <laughs> right. Well, and also you didn't have to agree on them amongst yourselves because that would probably never have happened. But since it was a condition of funding, then that makes it all yes work. A good part of a triangle. <laughs> Those people made us do it. <laughs> right. Hooray. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Great question. <laughs> okay, um, <clears throat> next up is Stephanie Ferreira. Go ahead, Stephanie. Okay, thank you. Um, well, this is it's very interesting and, in, you know, how, what a natural project this was for you kitty coming back to your family farm and and your home you know the land that you were so attached to and being able to do as much as you did but one of the points that i noticed was that the murphy farm was sold to that was you know a fairly sizable business that was sold to smithfield which in turn has been uh, bought by somebody in China. Yes, <laughs> and it, 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 it this this whole enterprise, uh, as it, from a business point of view, it's followed the same pattern that so many businesses have in uh, in all different areas of our economy, yeah. where you know something somebody starts something from uh, their own create creativity, their own energy. And uh, if it looks like it's going to be profitable, soon, soon it's going to be bought by a larger entity. And yes. then, you know, and and in the process, it seems that those who are in the ownership position and I would assume making fairly key decisions about the business are further and further removed from the land. Absolutely. And that you know. Yeah. I was wondering what what since that all has happened, what differences do you notice in the way the um, the hog industry is functioning? Can, well, can you see a difference there? 
Uh, that's a wonderful question, Stephanie, and, and it's just good to see you and chat again about some of these things. Um, I have been here in Wilmington for, soon will be, um, I can't believe it, but soon will be seven years. So I have been a bit removed from actually knowing the day by day kind of experiences of the people there. When I lived there and worked at the medical center and the mental health centers and did some of the other things I was involved in, I really had a chance to, you know, interface with those people who uh, loaded those trucks and the people who washed out the hog, hog lagoons and the people that operated the spray fields. And, you know, you had, I had a better sense of from knowing the uh, citizens, what was going on. Um, I understand from people who live there that it has become more and more remote. And the rumor is that the best port goes to China. <laughs> and so the port that's in the American oh. markets is second grade. <laughs> but I don't know if that's true or just, you know, a, a, a rumor. I, I have no idea. Uh, supposedly, the corporation um, goes by our same federal regulations and guidelines, but it's interesting that recently um, there has been a gag order that was uh, voted on by our, our legislature in North Carolina that prohibits people talking about what goes on in these industries. Mm -hmm. And um, that is a bit alarming. There have been millions and millions and millions of dollars that these industries have been sued for health reasons, for all the things that have happened to families, to their homes. Um, I mean, it is, it, it has bred an atmosphere where uh, the gangs are very rampant. Uh, they're, and, and it's understandable. Uh, if I had to live with 14 people in a single wide trailer and work a 10 hour shift uh, cutting open chickens and taking care of their insides, I, I would do, I don't know what, I wouldn't last but a day and I would die. But um, it, it, it is a, a societal process that's driven by enormous anxiety. And, you know, some people want to blame someone or blame something, but it's, who, who is there to blame? It is a societal process. I mean, Murphy was a golden child at state. Uh, he did exactly what he was taught. Um, you know, he was the product of a university system of science. Um, they know exactly the right amount of hormones and antibiotics to give those animals. Uh, it isn't a haphazard you know, fly by night operation. It's very exact. Uh, so who, who do you, who, there is no blame in this. It's just understanding how it operates. And it's, um, <coughs> it's interesting. <laughs> so so it, it's become very in, industrialized and very oh, yeah. corporate. So the, 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 the workers uh, and the, and the care, the conditions of, of raising the animals are at the low end of the concerns and the, mm. you know, as, it, as it builds and you get more and more uh, profit motive operating, you see that deterioration. Yes. It's, 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 there's so many examples in our society of, the, of how that happens. Well, one of your beautiful pictures of the river made me um, think about, we have an organization of, in Chicago that's called Friends of the Chicago River. Yes. The Chicago River um, was polluted very badly. It was sort of like the, 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 the back door of the city. Lake Michigan was the, you know, was highly valued. The, the river was not until <laughs> until it started people did start to pay attention and it seems like when you come down to something as basic as your waterways and those waterways are being destroyed that supply so many people um, with that basic necessity it seems like that would really mobilize uh, some organized um, 
opposition to to these practices well there has there has been some there have been several groups that have been organized that have addressed this um the river keepers association specifically um there have been in north carolina books written there have been many publications there's been a whole newspaper series it was a uh, pulitzer prize winning series on boss hog and uh when the organism Fisteria was discovered and it lived part of its life cycle as a plant and part of it as an animal uh, there was a tremendous amount written about about that and the reason and some of the thinking about how that evolved in relation to all this turmoil and abuse and um so it 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 really it really has happened in north carolina there have been tremendous lawsuits handled by the Riverkeepers Association of Robert Kennedy Jr., for example, has been very involved with people in Duplin County in the Pace Law School in New York um, in bringing um, you know, suits against the industry. It's ongoing. They're, the legislature has now put a cap on how much they can be sued for because uh, it's just, it's, you, you almost feel like when you're in it, it's completely and totally out of control. Yeah. Uh, and that that is the feeling level, the emotional level. And um, to take a position around one issue, uh, you know, is very challenging because the industry controls everything. The schools, they control the libraries, they control medical care. If you, in your job, talk about the industry, then you may be fired. That happened to a friend of mine. Um, and, um, you know, they will not tolerate the uh, disagreement with what they're doing. So it, it breeds violence. North Carolina, you know, has, or Dufin County has the highest number of uh, Hispanic immigrants in the state. And, um, you know, it, it just involves so many issues on so many levels. Yeah. So it's, it's, it gets back to very fundamental issues of social justice in many ways. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Kitty. Thanks, Stephanie. Good to see you. <laughs> Okay, um, up next is um, Eileen Gottlieb. Did you unmute me? Yes, I did. Okay. Hi, Kitty. Hi, Eileen. It's so good to see you. Likewise. <laughs> I have a really interesting story. Our synagogue, synagogue is um, it's a block from the ocean in Palm Beach, and it sits in the middle of some of the most valuable real estate, probably in the country. One of our members died and he gifted a lot of land next to the synagogue for the synagogue to use for whatever purpose it chose. And the synagogue decided to build a meditation garden and a community garden. And the town of Palm Beach brought a suit against the congregation. And it went on for about six years, but the congregation prevailed. Yay. So we got our meditation garden and we got our community garden. And it's a small victory, but I think it yes. says something about if you believe in what it is you wanna do and you're willing to stand up to whomever and you're not afraid, that you may just be able to accomplish it. Yes. I think it's also ironic that a hundred years ago, Palm Beach, there were signs that said no dogs and Jews allowed. And today there are two congregations, one Orthodox and the other conservative. That is wonderful. So I wanted to share that with you. Oh, Eileen. Um, Oh, that is wonderful. What a wonderful story. Yeah. Yes. So good to see you. Good to see you as well.
All right, um, up next is Laura Hafstad. <clears throat> You're unmuted. Okay. Hi, Kitty. <laughs> and every it's good to see see you and it's well here. Yeah. Um so I, 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 I I'm terribly connected to <clears throat> um these issues because um, for a number of reasons, and um, <clears throat> I'm having a little dilemma as to how personal to get and um, how much the, the, the point I want to make is, but <clears throat> I went to UC Davis, uh, which was <clears throat> the agricultural campus of the University of California, and I guess it was because I was there that <clears throat> Um, I ended up living uh, amongst um, a number of college students. Um, we all got houses out of town, and <clears throat> I was never uh, part of the, um, the farming community, but my friends were, and um, <clears throat> they, they were active. This was in the early 70s, and they were some of the very um, well, that was, you know, um, the counterculture back to the land movement. And they were um, very interested. They were studying agriculture and they were practicing it. They were leasing orchards, um, different fruit orchards uh, out in, in that part of the country um, and and trying to make some money doing farming, um, all city kids, but they were part of this back to the land movement. And they, I don't know, I, uh, I, they were very early in the sustainability, um, they called it sustainable agriculture. So um, that was my college years. And then, um, <clears throat> so I raised my, children um, in a, 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 a semi-rural area um, where gardening is taught in the schools and um, <clears throat> and they all ended up having connections to food and <clears throat> my youngest daughter married a farmer and they are doing sustainable regenerative farming in central Oregon, which is not an easy place to do that. But they, they now have about 150 acres that um, they do something they call biodynamic farming. Um, raising meat, hogs and uh, pork and beef is, is part of it. Um, where they rotate the animals and they rotate crops and the um, the focus is on <clears throat> um, restoring soil and um, <clears throat> and it's, and and they're part of a community of other young people doing the same thing and in fact um, there's a, a, a community uh, that extends across the Western states that I've become somewhat familiar with. There's um, a podcast called Mountain and Prairie um, that Ed Roberson, who's actually from North Carolina, is the host of that show. And <clears throat> I became aware of it because he was talking to uh, uh, people in, in the West and a lot of them are farmers and ranchers and um, but also creatives artists and they seem to have a lot of um, a, a lot of these young people are just very creative and so but the point I, I want to get to is actually the first principle of sustainability which is economic viability so these young farmers um, are are really trying to do it a different way. 
I mean, that's their answer to all this. And there's an organization in Portland, Oregon called EcoTrust, which um, sounds like it had a lot in common with that, um, uh, the Magnolia Partners, in that their mission is the um, support of uh, mid-sized farmers and even fisheries and different food producers, where they have mentorship programs and they take these young farmers, a lot of them who have gotten into it because they're part of family farms. Um, in my daughter's case, the, it's not a multi-generational family farm, but her husband's parents basically financed purchasing of property. And, and so the families are part of it and they get mentorship in the business of farming. But the business of farming at this mid-level, um, it's like the agricultural systems have gone so far in the direction that you've been describing about corporate farming that there are just so many systemic problems at each step of the way. So, for instance, um, one of the things that they're having to develop is a method of distributing food, of distributing the, the produce and, and the meat because the distribution systems are somehow scaled to these very large car corporate farming operations. So, you know, they can get the land, they can, you know, produce the food, but then they have to sell it, they have to market it, yeah. they have to distribute it and all of that. So, um, <clears throat> anyway, we're watching with great interest. I don't, you know, I, I've got, I have my fingers crossed. Um, there was a, um, a film that you might be aware of, I think it's called The Biggest Little Farm that kind of got popular just in the past year. Um, and it was a story of a, of a couple that sort of left, I think Hollywood or something, uh, to do regenerative farming. And um, there is a lot of vitality and interest and energy. And um, it's taken a lot of creativity, but um, anyway, I thought I would just put all that in. Oh, that is wonderful and just the very best to your daughter and your family. I, th I think there's such energy and such aliveness and uh, for a soft word, a lot of hope in uh, young people who are actually getting it, so to speak, and seeing uh, that there is a way through this to the other side that uh, is relational and respectful and uh, is so different from sustainable. <laughs> it is truly sustainable. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, um, next up is Elsa Lau. Oh, thank you. Um, sorry, everyone. I prefer not to show my face because I'm in my pajamas. Um, um, I'm from Melbourne. I worked for a cancer support service. Uh, for a few years. So I'm very interested in uh, the relationship of forest medi medicine in relation to cancer. Um, can Mary um, comment more about this? Or can I refer to any readings or books uh, yes. in, in regard to the topic? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. And, and that is such a good one. I am such a novice at that whole idea. It was just so phenomenal to me. But if you will do research or Google uh, forest medicine, uh, the Japanese particularly and people there and in Germany are just doing a lot of uh, research in that area. And there are some wonderful articles that, uh, and I don't have a reference to them, but I have seen them online. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure you can find more there. And there are some um, places in the United States that are beginning to offer this. The American Forestry Association is offering uh, training and internships in forest therapy 
and uh, they don't get into the clinical and medical side of it as much as into the preventive and the experiential uh, elements of being in the forest. Um, but it is just a very interesting feel for me and uh, in learning about it. And I, I wish I were more knowledgeable and had more resources that I could uh, share with you. And, and I'm, I regret I don't, but uh, good luck with your online search. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Jessica, it's 9.20. Okay. Um, <laughs> Kern, do you want to say anything else? I've unmuted you. Yes, I would like to say very much a thank you for, from, for Kitty and all that she's put into her work and her research over the years and, and her willingness to bring that to us once again. Um, we heard her in the earlier years and she was working on this then. <clears throat> Let me give you a, an idea of next month. Next month on May the 28th, we have Dr. Kathleen Smith, who's a faculty member at the Bowen Center, and she'll be talking about writing about Bowen theory for a popular audience. Much different from what we're hearing this weekend. <laughs> so thank you all for your participation, and please come back. See you hopefully tomorrow and the next day. Thanks. Good night, Good night, everyone. <laughs> night, Kitty. Good night, Anne. Good night, all. <laughs> <laughs>